Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hello again. I'm Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. Living Word is a teaching program, and we are drawn closer and closer to our God in a wonderful living relationship with Him as we continue to get to know Him through His Living Word. And we are currently in the Gospel of Matthew. We are getting closer and closer to that uh, time when Jesus is going to be arrested and then crucified. And let's begin now with a word of prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is indeed a lovely day that you have made. We rejoice in you. We rejoice in your Son. We rejoice in the Holy Spirit. We thank you for all you are doing among us. We ask now that the words that I will proclaim will be anointed by your Spirit and that our hearts would be anointed uh, to receive this word. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, yesterday we heard that God has a dress code which allows anyone who wants to be a guest at the wedding banquet to remain in the celebration. The parable that we heard was about the king who had planned a wedding banquet for his son. All was ready, but the guests who had been invited weren't interested in coming to the banquet. The consequences for them was severe. But what was the king to do? The wedding banquet was ready, but there still weren't any guests. To fill the wedding banquet hall with guests, the king sent out his servants to go into the highways and the byways and invite anyone they could find. So they went out into the streets and they gathered all that they could, both good and bad. The wedding hall was filled with guests, but when the king came in to see the guests, there was a man there who wasn't wearing wedding clothes. And wearing wedding clothes was a requirement for remaining as a guest of the king at his son's wedding banquet. The man was tied up and thrown out into the outer darkness where there is going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Though we do not know all of the various traditions and customs which may have been associated with and connected to the parable Jesus was telling the religious leaders, we conjectured that it may have been the custom for the king to have supplied his invited guests with garments or with clothes to put over their own clothing. If this was the case, then this man would have refused the king's garment in order to wear his own clothes. Such a thing was not going to be allowed. He was not allowed to stay. Though we may not know all of the traditions and the customs to which Jesus may have been alluding to in this particular parable, we do know this. The only way any of us are going to acquire or have a permanent place at the wedding banquet of God's own Son will be by our covering our own selves, our own clothes, with Jesus' blood and righteousness. There is no other way, no other way to get into... Uh, the banquet hall, the festivities, the celebration of God's Son uh, and His wedding banquet. Now, what part of no other way don't we understand? It's quite clear. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' audience for the telling of the parable of the wedding banquet, they were the religious leaders who were questioning Jesus prior to his arrest and crucifixion. These religious leaders had ignored John the Baptist's proclamation, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They had dismissed their need to repent as they saw the tax collectors and sinners confessing their sins and being baptized by John. They watched and they criticized Jesus' ministry as he taught the people with authority and as he did mighty works among them. They were thinking that they could ignore the invitation God was giving them to come to the wedding banquet of his son. They were also thinking that they could come to the banquet in their own clothes. 
This simply was not true. God has a dress code. Have we put on the pure white robe of Jesus' righteousness? Have we been washed in the blood of the spotless Passover Lamb of God? I pray that all of us have. There is absolutely no need for anyone to be left out of the wedding banquet God is preparing for his son. There is absolutely no need for anyone to get kicked out of the wedding hall. We know the requirement. Will we fulfill it? Today we begin our reading with Matthew 22, verse 15. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Their questioning is interesting, isn't it? First, they butter Jesus up with words of flattery and praise such as, we know you're a man of integrity. You teach the way of God. You aren't swayed by men. You pay no attention to who they are. We know they were trying to trap Jesus in his words. So their trap appears to have been this. They flatter him with how he teaches the way of God, but they aren't looking for God's opinion on paying taxes to Caesar. They want Jesus' opinion. Could they get him to take his eyes off of God? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Now do we realize the tremendous example Jesus has given to us here? How many times are we asked to give our opinion on a matter which has been clearly settled by God in his word? Our opinion doesn't count. God's opinion is what counts. Our answer needs to be, God said such and such, and that settles it for me. To be able to make such a clear and decisive statement about any topic in the scriptures, we have first got to know God's word ourselves. And we have got to believe that it is the final authority for us. If we think that God's word is only a suggestion, then we will not be able to stand firm in the tests and trials and temptations of life. Jesus stood his ground by standing on the word of God His opinion was whatever God had already said. Nothing more and nothing less. The disciples of the Pharisees, they were understandably impressed. Verse 23. That same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have children for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, You are in error, because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels of heaven. Concerning marriage, the Sadducees, they were getting tripped up by the practice known as leveret marriage. Leveret marriage was practiced in Israel in order to keep land in a particular family. If a man died without having any children, his brother was to marry his widow, and the first child of the new marriage was understood to belong to the dead man. The first thing the Sadducees needed to understand, however, was that death actually did sever the marital bond. This is why in the case of every other couple, the surviving spouse could go ahead and remarry without fear of committing adultery. Death broke 
the legal bond of marriage. And then Jesus clarifies that the union is not restored at the resurrection. At the resurrection, people will not marry or be given in marriage. We will be like angels in this regard. Now notice, we will be like angels. We will not be angels. We will be like them. Angels do not marry. Neither will people marry at the resurrection. Now having clarified the misunderstanding the Sadducees had about marriage, Jesus went on to say, but about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, far too many people skip over the obvious insight God gives us in his word about many things. Much insight can be gained simply by pondering the little words which we so easily pass over and by paying attention to the verbs in the sentences. Now, I know that many people grumble about you know, having to take English grammar or any kind of grammar course in any language, but there is much insight to be gained by considering the verbs God has used over and over again to describe himself. When Moses asked God what his name was, God answered by saying, I am who I am. The verb am, A-M, is a present tense verb with continuing or ongoing action. When God would say, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, he was saying, I am, even now, Abraham's God. I am, even now, Isaac's God. I am, even now, Jacob's God. The fact that the bodies of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had long been in their graves did not change the fact that they were nevertheless very much alive and in the presence of God. God's own word had continuously given testimony to the reality of the resurrection. The Sadducees had missed it because they had not given serious thought to how God kept describing himself. Had they listened and considered the word am, they would have had no trouble believing in the resurrection. Now, we aren't told how the Sadducees responded to what Jesus said. We are, however, told how the crowds responded. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. As I did yesterday, I'm going to run a portion of a Sunday morning message I gave on this passage, and then I'll make a couple of more closing remarks and then bless you all. Well, the text for this morning begins with Matthew chapter 22. We will use a number of other passages as well, but I will read those as we get to them. But uh, the passage that we have in front of us from Matthew 22 is interesting because it starts out by saying, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees. In other words, hearing that he had silenced some of the religious leaders, Sadducees and Pharisees, they were two different sects of um, religious groups. And so uh, seeing, hearing that he had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. <laughs> He's like, going, what is this? You know, okay. He, he stumped you. Let's see if he can stump us. I don't know. But anyway. And so they got together. They got an expert in the law to ask him the question. You know, what is the greatest commandment? And you know what? This was a no-brainer. <laughs> so it's like, how can that be the hardest question they could come up with? You know, what is the most important commandment? What's the greatest one? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then probably without even breathing, Jesus said, and the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. 
I mean, the whole of the law and the prophets can be summarized by the word love. Well, it isn't just any old kind of love. In the Greek, we have four different kinds of love. And this particular one is agape love. Agape love is the expression of love uh, that is uh, of intelligence or purpose. It is a matter of the will. We willingly, we will ourselves to love the others that we are supposed to be loving. Agape implies that we know the true God in all of his greatness and all of his grace and that we turn to him with all our whole being. I mean, do you notice already all of the alls? It's all of us. We find out that God will not have just a mere sliver of us or a mere part of us. No, he doesn't want just a part of us. He wants all of us. He doesn't want just even a little part of us just that's not dedicated to him. He wants the whole thing, the whole kit and caboodle. He wants the whole heart, the whole heart from our understanding. You know, the Hebrews thought that the heart was the center of the being. That's the heart, our, the center of our personality. And he wants our whole soul, and the soul was our consciousness. Okay? And then our whole mind, the activity of our entire brain, that is what We are told God wants. He wants all of us. He wants all of us to cleave to him, to cling to him. Now, this kind of love is actually exemplified for us in the Old Testament book of Ruth. Naomi and her husband Elimelech had gone to Moab to live because there was a a famine in in Bethlehem. And uh, and so they took their two sons, Machlon and Kilion, with them. And there they went to Moab until, you know, so long as the famine was going on in, in Bethlehem. Well, during that time, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died. And then Orpah and Ruth's husbands both died. And so Naomi and Ruth and Orpah were left there. Now, Orpah and Ruth, they were from Moab. And so that was their native country. It would have been easy for them just to go back home, or so you think. And so Naomi said, go back to your parents' house. Maybe you'll be able to find another husband. Orpah decides to go. You know, just thinking, you know, back in those days, it really wasn't good for women to be left alone in the world. I mean, the men were the primary means of support. So Ruth says, you know, look... She sees Orpah going off. She now looks at Ruth and says, look, your sister-in-law is heading back home. You go too. And that's when Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates us. That is devotion. That is 100% love for another person. And you know, this kind of a love that we're talking about here that clings to God is also a love that thirsts for God. Psalm 42 is one of those passages that I really like. And I would love to have this kind of a love for God or a desire for God on an ongoing basis. I have prayed for this kind of love for God, to thirst after God. And you know what? I found out that it's pretty, uh, what's the word I want to say? It's pretty intolerable to have this kind of a thirst for God that just is hard to be quenched. But the psalmist writes... As a deer pants for water, for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Can you hear the thirst? The desire just to take a drink from God's fountain of living water. The two greatest commandments really can be summarized by loving God and by loving our neighbor because God is love. The first commandment, of course, is to love God, and the second is to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, that can be kind of hard. 
truth of God's word says we are the king's kids. John writes in 1 John 4, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. The two go together. Love God. Love neighbor. If we don't love the people that we can see, how can we love the one? St. Paul gave us that beautiful description of love in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always hopes, always trusts, always perseveres. Love never fails. Okay, did we score a 100 on that one? I mean, none of us measures up to that kind of love. So how well are we doing on keeping these two commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Have we set our heart's desire on fulfilling these two commandments? Now, maybe we're wondering, well, how in the world is that even possible? How could I possibly fulfill either one of these commandments? Well, the fact of the matter is that we can't on our own. It's absolutely true. We cannot, in any way, shape, or form, fulfill these two commandments on our own. We belong to a fallen humanity. It is only as God comes to live and dwell within us, in the person of the Holy Spirit, that we are able to become learners of this kind of love. We can certainly meditate on God's word. We can meditate on what God has done for us. We can meditate on that and we can chew on that and we can ponder it and we can pray, God, change my heart. Change my heart. You know, one of the things that we've got to understand is that God will mold us and shape us and fashion us to make us into the creature, to the person that he would have us be. He's wanting to create each and every one of us into the image of his son. And so since that is God's desire, when we are working alongside of him and cooperating with his spirit, then it is amazing what God is able to accomplish in us. Yes, every single one of us have sharp edges and things that need to get smoothed off and chiseled away. But we've got to understand that we, in fact, can become learners of this kind of love. Jesus answered the question correctly when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In Luke's Gospel, we get to hear about a young man that says, well, who's my neighbor? Well, we find out in Luke's gospel that our neighbor is anybody who is in need. And so our neighbor can be somebody who lives next door to us and we have known forever and ever. Or our neighbor can be somebody 
who we just meet and we realize they're in need right then and there. And so we stop and we help them. That's how we love other people. Love doesn't have to be extravagant. Love can be just simple, simple acts of kindness. But it is a decision to love as we have been loved. And we have been, in, been loved with an eternal love. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Love gives. So we need to be determined to love as we have been loved. And we can know that our love is indeed um, effective and in action by how we uh, carry it out in the world. That's how we do it. Is we, you know, do what the Lord wants us to do. Follow his example. So that's where we're going to stop today. Tomorrow we're going to finish chapter 22 and get into chapter 23. But let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you that though the, uh, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and their disciples and the, the religious leaders, they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know that they were inspecting your Passover lamb. But we thank you, Heavenly Father, that they were doing exactly what you had planned and purposed for them to be doing from before the creation of the world. We thank you that all of your plans and purposes were coming together on that particular week. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that as we look at what happened in those last days of Jesus' life, you know, we really get a good chance a good opportunity to see how you bring your plans and purposes together. Well, Heavenly Father, we know that you've got continuing plans and purposes for the next time your Son comes to earth. And so we know that all of your plans and purposes, they will all come together as you so desire them to come together. Heavenly Father, we pray that we will do our part we pray that we would not be unwitting participants as the scribes, as the Pharisees, as the, as the Sadducees were. We pray that we would be willing participants in the preparations that you are bringing together as his return gets closer and closer. We pray that we will, in fact, be participants with you. And so we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you were able to do and accomplish all that you have planned and purposed and we look forward to that day. Heavenly Father, I, I bless all these people who have been listening. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining, Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, His Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as means through which He reveals Himself and His will to us. God is love. And regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer and He can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box, 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share, or would like to purchase a CD of this message, and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www.livingwordradio.org. If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.